Um, welcome to our first live talk on building better runner. Um, let me start with some introductions. This is Kaylee Burns from Big Sky Natural Health, Megan Porter from Moving Mountains, and myself, Heidi Bowman from Lone Peak Physical Therapy. Uh, the goal of this group is just to collaborate on our areas of expertise and to give people something to think about and apply to their own running practice. Um, especially with races getting canceled and summer plans changing, projects changing, hopefully we can give you something to work on. Um, where to start? We're going to kind of start at the basics. There's so many topics we could have talked about. So we wanted to just give you some foundation and something usable for home. Um, so from my side, I'm going to start on some injury prevention. So what matters for a runner? Physically, runners need three things. We need to have good motion. We need to be able to control the motion we do have. And you need to have some power. Um, today, I'm going to start off with mobility and how well you're moving. So first question for you is, when you're running, do you feel symmetrical? Do you feel balanced? You know, as you're running, do you feel your arm swing is similar side to side? Do you feel like your feet are hitting similarly? Um, the next day, do you feel similarly sore? Or do you have one calf that always gets tired and one shoulder that's maybe a little more sore? That means there's an imbalance somewhere. Uh, if you aren't symmetrical, there's a compensation happening somewhere. And this is making you less efficient. Efficiency matters for running. You know, running is hard anyway, so it costs a lot of energy. We don't want to be spending extra energy to, you know, cheat and move differently. Um, compensations happen because your body finds a way to keep moving forward. The problem with this is it also increases your risk of in in an injury. So the other question, so number one question is, do you feel symmetrical? Two is, do you need to be flexible to be a good runner? I get this in the clinic all the time. People will say, I'm really bad about a stretching routine. And part of me thinks, well, how flexible do you need to be in order to be a good runner? Not necessarily that flexible. So thinking more of what matters is where do you need to move well in order to run well? There's four body areas we're gonna talk about today. These are all joints, so we're talking about bone motion. If you don't move well at the bones, this is that foundation, then your muscles and soft tissue can't move well either. Uh, so, four joints. We're gonna talk about the big toe, the ankle, the hip, and the upper back, or thoracic spine. Starting with big toe. Let me get some things out of the way. You can move this along with me. Uh, with this one, our first movement is just to come up onto your big toe. So my big toe's down, my heel is lifting, I'm kind of getting a feel for how much motion I have here. It's really nice to have a mirror in this case, so you can kind of peek in the mirror and just get a good visual for how much you're moving. And then you can compare to the other side. At home, you know, there are certain numbers or degrees of motion you need, but that's really hard to know at home if it's good motion or bad motion. So what you're looking for is symmetry and that you can get to that same point without any pain. A lot of times I'll see people can get here, but they'll be like, oh, that really hurts. Then we know that joint is not moving well. Uh, something else we have here is not only do you want to be able to be on your you know, motion here, you want to be able to have a little balance there. You know, can you hold it? You may not quite be able to get complete balance, but you should have a little bit of stability on that big toe. Again, if we think about running, this is important. As we're coming forward, that big toe is that push-off piece. If you don't have that, something else has to move a little bit more. So that's big toe. Second, we're going to talk about ankle. Uh, in order to just really feel this well, I think it's easier to do kneeling. And even better if you have a wall. We're going to imagine this is a wall in front of me. If you want to be able to keep your heel down, and see how far back you can move your foot and still touch your knee to the wall. I'm not quite touching, so I have to move my foot forward a little bit until I'm able to touch. Key here is to make sure you don't rotate to get this, that everything stays square to the wall and then get that touch. Uh, hopefully you have more motion than I do. This is my bad angle. You can put your other foot exactly in the same place and just compare. 
can see that probably in the video, I have a little bit better motion on this side. So I know my right ankle is an issue and I need to work on it. Again, we're feeling for symmetry and just that it's not painful when we get to that end point. This is also a good place to kind of take a look at hip motion. Here we're looking at hip extension or how well your leg can go behind you as you're running because that's important. If I don't have good motion from the hips, my low back does it for me. This is where a lot of times people will tell me their low back hurts after a long run. So again, we're kneeling. Uh, in order to not use your low back, a good trick is to just small tilt under, tap your tail, post your pelvic tilt. That way you really feel the front of your hip and just seeing how well you can move. Again, hopefully you have more than me, but we're looking for some symmetry here. Again, it's also helpful to have a mirror so you can visually see about how far you're able to move in and out of that. Lastly, we're gonna look at some thoracic spine motion. This is where I'm gonna use a chair. I'm, I'm angling the chair so that the corner is pointing forward. And then using a ski pole or a dowel or something like that. So I'm gonna angle this corner facing you. I've got the dowel to make it easy to measure. And I'm just seeing how well I can rotate right, left. I can feel that I'm not very good at going left. Uh, at a minimum, you want 45 degrees. So as I turn, I should be able to get the corner of this dowel pointing towards the opposite corner of the chair without moving my lower body. It has to really be nice and level. If you're stiff, a lot of times you'll see this little cheek where you'll get some side bend or the hips wanting to help. So really trying to get a good measure for that. Thoracic spine becomes important during running because it's arm swing. If you don't move well from your upper back, then you can't get that nice symmetry and that crossover from the upper body to the lower body. So there's our four joints. Um, we're looking for symmetry. We're looking for no compensations. If you do not move well at one of those four areas, your body's still going to figure out a way to go forward. So something else is going to cheat for you. So a lot of times it's one joint above or below. I see people most commonly for knee pain with running in the clinic. If we think about knee pain, a lot of times my first screen is, do you move well one joint below at the ankle and one joint above at the hip? If there is something limited on either side, that knee is really good at just cheating a little bit, which can be okay for a short time, but eventually it's gonna give you pain and kind of cause some injuries. Uh, another big one I hear a lot about is just my low back hurts when I run. This is really oftentimes that, you know, poor hip extension mobility um, or poor stability to be able to control that movement. So keep in mind that all four of those tests we just went through are static positions, meaning we're measuring them you know, almost in like a clinic setting where we're just gauging symmetry, but it's not movement. It's not going to look and feel the same as running. So, you know, you may show really good motion here, but then if we were to watch you run, it may not necessarily show what you're running too. This is a first quick screen. It's easy to do at home, but if there is something that's more concerning or there's a big asymmetry, that's where a running video analysis can be really helpful. Um, and having someone like show you vectors or planes and movement in order to, you know, visually see what it looks like in running. I'll give you a little more information about that later, but um, now that we've gone through these movements, let's return to some questions. Do you need a stretching routine? It depends. So you need to personalize it to address your weaknesses. So if one of those four areas is not moving well, you definitely better be working on that before you go out and run. The other piece of that is you need to prepare your body for movement, in this case running. So a warm-up routine should look and feel like running if it's preparing you to go run. Uh, this is where I'll, I'll post this video later. I have a video for the Big Sky Community Organization Community Challenge where it's a really quick dynamic running video warm-up. It takes two to three minutes because 
it takes more than that. I'm probably not doing it. I'm not great at stretching before I run. And as you can see, I probably need it more than anybody. Um, but it quickly addresses those four areas. So if we were going to really quickly just say the test is the exercise, you know, we want to make sure you have big toe motion. We want to make sure you have some ankle motion. A great position here is a little bit of a lunge. So uh, from the side, you can see I'm getting some extension on that big toe. My big toe is moving. I'm feeling the stretch here, my left foot of the hip. I can shift forward and get my right ankle moving. And I can kind of add some rotation in to get that arm swing prepared for running. Um, again, I'll post that a little bit more specifically later. But the thought is, is the test is the exercise. So if you have some stiffness, just go through that test position and start working it and seeing if you can loosen it up on your own. Um, so this covers some thoughts on how to address stiffness or areas that don't move well. The flip side of this is what if you find you have a lot of motion and what do you do about that? That's where, you know, you need to focus more on the stability piece. You need to be able to control the motion you do have. So from a mobility perspective to review, the take home message is, do you feel symmetrical? Are you moving well from all four of those key areas? And are you preparing the body for running and addressing your weaknesses before you start the activity? <laughs> now that you have some moving ideas, let's work on some of this dynamic strength control and I'll pass it over to Megan. Hey guys. So, Heidi just told us what we need in order to, what kind of movement we need in order to be effective at running. So where I want to take this is how do we build control and stability within those movements that are required. Two seconds. So this is where strength, come, strength training comes in. There are many benefits to strength training for running. First, injury prevention. This is what Heidi focused on. Huge, no, right? Nobody wants to be in the PT clinic because you're not feeling good, or nobody wants to be on the sidelines when your friends are out there on the trail because you're not feeling good. So if you go into that season strong, you are going to be feeling much better out there in those early runs. Second is kind of obvious, but needs to be said. You are strengthening your muscles. But you're not only strengthening your muscles, you're also strengthening your connective tissues, the tissue that connects your muscles to your bones and everything in between. Beyond that, you're also increasing your neuromuscular control, which is going to help increase your speed, and increasing your coordination, which is going to help you when you trip on that rock, need to catch yourself, as well as it's going to increase your overall stride efficiency. So, what does this mean for training? Well, when we train for running, we have to think, if you want to be successful in that training now, and especially as we age, if you want to be running for years in the future, you have to take a comprehensive approach to your training. So what that means is that we look at what running does, and this is very similar to Heidi's approach in, her, um, in how she determined what mobility exercises to give you guys today. So what do we do in running? we determined already that it's a forward sport and that it requires rotation. So we're gonna train forward and backwards and we're gonna train some rotation. But we also have to train for that unexpected, that rock that jumps out of nowhere, the route that you trip on. I know many of us are trail runners and we're on uneven surfaces all the time. We have to jump in over mud puddles and just never know what you're gonna find out there on the trail. So you have to be prepared for the unexpected. So, in our world, we call that training in three planes. Forward and back is the sagittal plane, side to side is the frontal plane, and rotational is the transverse plane. So what does that look like in your training? Well, um, backing up a little bit, when we're selecting what we're training those, in those three planes, we're gonna think about three specific zones. So, we, for today, for running specifically, we're going to talk about strengthening your glutes, we're going to talk about strengthening your quads, and then we're going to talk about strengthening your core. So your glutes, that's, that's your main driver, that's what's powering you forward and uphill. Your quads, that's your control as you go downhill, and your core connects all the dots and helps to keep you upright. 
So from here, I'm gonna give you three exercises for each of those three, um, three zones. And they're all going to be, there's gonna be a little bit of lateral, a little bit of forward back, and a little bit of rotation, like we talked about. So starting with the glutes. Like I said before, this is your prime driver. They are broken up into three muscles. You've got your gluteus maximus and minimus. These are your main drivers. And then you also have your gluteus medius, and this is huge for hip stability. And that is big in trail running, right? We need stable hips. So how do we strengthen these things? I have three exercises for you. Um, first, we're gonna start out with a single leg Romanian deadlift. This is all about balance and hip stability. So you're gonna start by standing on one leg. You're gonna draw your belly button in nice and tight, not just in, but also up, creating length through your spine. Flat down at the ground with your toes on your standing leg so you can find that balance. This can be done, and most of these can be done with dumbbells or with your body weight only. So I'm gonna go body weight for now. I like hands on my hips because this is gonna keep my shoulders back in a nice lifted position. So from here, yeah, plenty of room. you're gonna take one leg up, you're gonna hinge forward, you're going to end in a capital letter T, and you're going to come back up. Some things to watch out for here is what are your hips doing? You want to keep your hips facing straight down at the ground, as well as your shoulders facing straight down at the ground. Your body ends in a capital letter T. So I'm one straight line from my head to my heel. I've got a slight internal rotation here, so that toe is pointing back at my standing leg. Everything strong and straight. You want to move through these slow. We are working on control. So the slower and the more controlled, the better. The next move is a reverse lunge to a step. So I'm going to do this here with dumbbells and bench. You can do this with, like I said, body weight only. You can step up on a stair, a boulder. The height doesn't really matter, but you want to be stepping up onto something. You don't want to go too high, but if you just have a stair, that's fine. So this is a dynamic movement with multiple parts. You're going to step about a foot away from whatever you're stepping up onto. You're going to bring one leg back into a, re a reverse lunge. Drop that back knee down. Now in your reverse lunge, you're one straight line from your shoulder through your hip all the way through that back knee. That back leg is going to come all the way up. You're going to slightly shift forward. You're going to feel that quad work already. And then you're going to stand up and you're going to stabilize at the top. Slow control all the way back down, back down into that lunge, making sure you're not falling forward or rotating as you do that. Now, if you want to get fancy with this move and make it even a little bit more specific, we can add some tempo to it. So we're going to add an eccentric contraction, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a little bit. But for now, all you need to know is that is a very slow lowering motion. So you're going to set up. Got my dumbbells on my sides. You're going to go down super slow. You're going to go powerful up, stand stabilized, and then down again super slow. My legs are shaking. <laughs> we had a good leg day at 9 30 today. <laughs> um, the last move of this block for your glutes is the lunge hold with rotation. Before I move on to this last one, I wanted to let you know that this one's great because it is working not only your glutes, but your quads and your core. So that is kind of a three for one, which I like to be as efficient as possible, hitting as many of those zones in one exercise as possible. So going to that rotational lunge, this is an isometric hold, which is just a hold. So you're gonna set up in a split stance, same, same mechanics apply for this as they do for the lunge in that your torso is up nice and tall. I'm not falling forward. I've got a ball or really anything or nothing on my chest. I'm going to hold that lunge and rotate into my front leg, front leg and then back to center. Into the front leg and back to center. Now if you want to make this a power movement and you have a wall that you can toss something up against, you can actually set up next to the wall and throw this into the wall. That is wonderful. That's actually my favorite way to do this move because as you release and catch, your body is forced to stabilize side to side. And you're also getting the benefit of that rotational 
or training. So those are your three glute focused exercises plus a little bonus. Um, your quads are next. So this is where that word eccentric is coming back. When you are downhill running, you're basically subjecting, you're, you're making your quads work in an eccentric, 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 wow, no one's tough today, lowering motion very intensely and quickly. So basically what that means is that your muscles are acting as a shock absorber and they're compressing and expanding very quickly. So how do we train this? Well, we want to train that eccentric contraction because that's what it's doing. So your three quad focus movements are gonna start with a single leg Bulgarian split squat. So you're gonna go back leg up on a bench. I like to go up on my toe. Some people prefer this. As long as you're feeling it more in the front quad than the back, I'm not concerned with which foot position you choose. But this front leg, this quad is where we should be feeling it. You're slightly leaning forward. You're gonna go down and drive your knee forward as you slowly lower down, come to about four, pause at the bottom, and come back up. Down for four, pause at the bottom, and come back up. Now, if you're feeling this movement too much in your glutes, that means you're putting too much body weight in your heel. So shift that weight forward, shift your knee forward in line with your toe, and make that quad fire. From there, we're going into a lateral squat walk. So this is another two for one, especially if you do this with a band, which I like to do with the band. Um, this is kind of a pants band, but example of a band, you can put that around your knees if you have one. So lateral squat walk, exactly like it sounds. You're gonna sit your butt down and back. You're in a squat, knees are slightly rotated out, chest is lifted. You're going to step to the side, shift, load that leg, bring it back to neutral. So the biggest thing I see people doing incorrectly in this is bringing your feet too close together. That and just kind of shuffling. We want to make the glutes work and the quads work at the same time. So slow this down, hold that squat, step, slide, your hips stay parallel with the ground, load that leg just like a single leg squat, Bring it, bring it back to neutral. All right, the last one is all about the training for the unexpected. We're gonna do a lateral hop to a runner's balance. So what you're gonna do is stand somewhere where you have enough room to hop to the side. You're gonna hop to the side, land on one leg. You're gonna stabilize, get low in that single leg squat and hold for five, four, three, two, one, hop to the other side. Balance, stabilize, hold for five. So same thing in there, if you're feeling more in your backside than your quads, shift that weight forward. We wanna make sure that your hips and your shoulders are square. You're not kind of hanging out here in your hold. You wanna be nice and square, making that balance leg work. Now if that doesn't feel good on your knees right away, just take out the impact. Step to the side. Hold as low as you can. Step to the side, hold as low as you can. So, last but not least is our core. Like I said before, the core connects all the dots. So in order to be an effective runner, you have to have good posture. And your core muscles are what is responsible for good posture. Specifically, your transverse abdominis or your deep, deep core muscles. So not only are those muscles responsible for that good posture, but if you have strong, deep core muscles, you're also going to allow your lower body to move more effectively. If you're strong in here, it's gonna help stabilize your pelvis so that your glutes can do their job to their best ability. So super important and exactly how they connect all the dots. So, Three movements to train your core. And for this, for core, in this example, I want you to think of your core from your shoulders all the way down to your glutes. And that's not just front side, we're not just talking six pack, this is wrapping all the way around. So 
We're talking back muscles, sides, and all the way down. A couple of these are even going to get into your glutes. So the first one, I would recommend doing elevated, in an elevated plank position if you've never done a move like this before. It's quite challenging on the floor. So it's a renegade row with a leg lift. You're going to set up with your hands on a bench or elevated on something. You can be hands on your palms or on your forearms. This is sometimes easier with people for people with wrist issues. Either way, whichever arm you're standing on or your, your weight is on, you're pushing up and away from that bench. Almost like you're at the top of a push-up. So you don't want to be dumping into that shoulder. Let your back muscles help you out at the top of that hole. From there, you're going to do a row with a little leg lift. So in that row, my elbow is staying in super close to my side. It's almost like it's wrapping around my rib cage, so I can get that extra little engagement here. In the leg lift, it's very small. I'm just creating a little bit of instability to challenge those core muscles, also putting that hip into extension, getting a little bit of glute activation. So it's lots of things you need for running, all in one motion. Do these slow and steady and work on your control. Your next movement is gonna be done on the floor. This can be done with a water bottle, a plate, anything, a dumbbell, anything you can pass back and forth. Uh, this is another good one, two for one. It's also gonna burn your quads. It's a nice isometric hold for your quads, as well as a good anti-rotation move to strengthen your core. So you're gonna come down on the ground, onto all fours. You're gonna place the dumbbell behind one of your wrists, curl your toes, under your knees. You might have to take a little bit wider stance than in line with your feet, maybe not that quite wide, but your biggest job, you have two big jobs here. First, to keep your knees just hovering off the ground. The second is to keep your hips stable as you pass the dumbbell under your chest. All right, so that's all about working for that stability. My quads are already on fire and I did like four. <laughs> it's a great effective movement. All right, we have one left. This one I call a flight lunge with alternating bent over row. That's a lot. So it looks like this. This is like a four for one. You're gonna get back strength, you're gonna get glute strength, stability, and core strength all in one. So you're going to set up with one leg forward, one leg back, nice wide stance. So not too wide, you want a nice neutral hip, but in line with your hips. From there, shift that weight forward a little bit so your knee is driving straight down into that heel. Belly's almost on the thigh, and then you're going to do alternating rows. You're going to allow your body to rotate slightly. All of the mechanics that we talked about before the renegade row apply in that position as well. And that is that when you're at the top, you're bent to 90 degrees, you're pulling back and slightly in. So you don't want to be feeling this one up here. You want to be feeling down in here. And then you'll feel your glutes light up pretty quick in that one too. So those are nine of my favorite movements that I use to train for running. Um, I will have a graphic with sets, a prescribed set and number of sets and number of repetitions for you when we are done with this video. But um, no matter how strong you go into the season and how balanced you go into the season, if you don't know how to fuel yourself on the trail, all of your training goes out the window. So now it's time to hear from Dr. Kaylee Burns. All right. Hi, everyone. So as a naturopathic physician, nutrition is one of my passions. Not only does it contribute vastly to our overall health through endurance training, I've also learned how much this plays into our success in terms of running. Um, so a lot of times people are wondering, what is this nutrition secret that all these professional runners have figured out? I can tell you it's not paleo, it's not vegan, it's not gluten-free. It's that they've become really talented eaters and they do not restrict calories. Um, so having a really solid nutrition plan for trail and endurance events is essential. Um, 
We've all heard it a thousand times. Do not try anything new on race day. There's a very valid reason for this. Anyone who's ever done it also learned that firsthand. Um, trying something new can have a detrimental effect to our success in an event. So the best time to practice is during your training. Really figure out what works for you. There's a lot of individuality that goes into this. Um, caloric expenditure is going to be affected by a number of factors, gender, weight, conditioning, etc. Um, on average, runners can take in about um, one gram of carbohydrate per minute. This equates to about 240 calories per hour. The reason for this is that when we're running, our blood flow is actually going to be diverted to our muscles and our heart and away from our digestive system. So this means that even if we're running at a very conservative pace, um, we're not going to be able to intake as many calories as we're going to burn. While our body does store fuel in the form of glycogen, glucose, fat, it can be very easy to fall short on calories rather quickly if we're not proactive and we're not fueling from the get-go. Intake will also vary from person to person. Some people can handle taking in that higher range of calories, other people cannot. Um, so here again, this is where practice is going to make all the difference. If you're finding that you're bonking sooner than you think you should, you might not be intaking enough. If you're feeling more um, bloating or digestive upset, perhaps you're taking in too much too quickly. Your body's really smart. It's going to give you cues, and it's up to us to listen to what it's trying to tell us. So if we break this down, the first thing we have to do is figure out what we are going to consume. What are you going to feel with? Um, are you somebody who wants to drink their calories? Would you prefer to chew them? Maybe a combination of both. Uh, there's a lot of endurance products out there. Are you going to stick to the gels and the chews? Or are you someone who's going to opt for more of the real food? Um, if you do use solid food, you need to make sure that you're intaking enough fluid to ensure proper hydration. Um, fluid is going to be affected by a number of different factors, and the general rule of thumb is to drink before you're thirsty. Um, Gels are probably our most common form of intake. Everyone, you know, all the endurance runners love our gels. Um, roughly, these have about 100 calories per little packet. Um, and they can come with things like electrolytes and caffeine, kind of these added little bonuses. However, intaking eight gels over the course of a few miles can get pretty monotonous. So having something that you can chew can be very beneficial. Um, give yourself a little bit of a mental break as well as that physical boost that we're looking for. Um, when we're choosing real food, we want to make sure that we're exercising some caution with this. In general, fewer ingredients is going to be better for us digestively. Um, so things like bananas, rice cakes, um, even peanut butter and jelly is fairly simple. Um, the big thing with this is to know prior to an event or race day, how this is going to affect our digestive system. Um, the most common contributing factor to like the runner gut, the digestive upset, is actually dehydration. So we have to be really mindful of how hydrated we are. And when it comes to fluids, we really can't intake, for the most part, enough of what we're going to need during the run. So we have to be fuel, um, hydrated before we start. Um, it's kind of like having a full tank before we get going. Um, if you plan to add your calories to your water, I really suggest that you also bring with you plain water and some kind of solid nutrition while you're still figuring out how the look of calories are going to agree with you. Coming from experience of trying many different ones, some of them just don't sit well with most people. Um, so you want to practice this, hands down. A lot of times doing a combination of both solid food and liquid calories is easier for our digestive system. That means that we're going to be able to take in um, a better caloric content, so likely what we are going to need and require to sustain our activity. Um, but we absolutely have to know how that's going to affect our stomach. Um, a lot of people are aware that carbohydrates, glucose, that's kind of the main fuel form for runners. However, some people notice that they like to add in protein as well, usually in the form of amino acids. Um, and so if, you, if you're someone who's planning to do that, you have to practice with that. 
keep track of how that makes you feel. Um, I wouldn't try any of those really fancy, like too big of products with these huge lists and all this sugar in there. Keep it really simple. Um, plain old amino acids are really easy to add to liquid nutrients. Um, so once you have your idea of what you're gonna consume, um, the next thing to figure out is how often you're gonna do that. Um, are you gonna do this on the hour? Are you someone who's gonna go more by mileage? Um, again, different approaches are gonna work better for different people. And this again is where we practice. Um, as time and miles go by, it can be really easy to lose track of our nutrition. Um, so we have to be proactive, we have to have a plan in terms of how we're going to keep track of that. A lot of people will set little reminders on their watch. Um, if you're running with a partner or a pacer, um, you know, sharing your plan with them, they can kind of help keep you accountable. If you're on a looped course, you can have something there to remind you. Either way, uh, you have to make sure that you're staying on top of it because if you do fall short and you start to bonk, it can be really hard to overcome that. Um, so to wrap up, um, we absolutely have two big things that we have to do. We have to start fueling from the get-go. Um, your best bet at beating a caloric deficiency is to be proactive. Um, you know, not starting to fuel two hours into the run when you're starving. On average, we want to start in that first 45 minutes or so. And secondly, and very importantly, do not stop fueling. There may come a point where uh, the sound of eating something or that food sounds not delicious to you and it might even make you feel a little bit nauseous thinking about consuming it, um, at which point you may be tempted to stop consuming. Do not do that. Um, find an alternative. Maybe um, reduce your intake, space it out a little bit more. Um, do not stop altogether. That can be quite detrimental to how you feel and your success um, in your training run or event. So keep fueling, just find another way to do so. As mentioned, the best time to practice your fueling is during your training. So start practicing um, drinking and eating your calories. It can be really beneficial to keep this as part of your training log. So with your mileage and your workouts, um, keeping track of your nutrition habits and your hydration. Um, as a well-built runner, you need to train your mind, your body, and your gut. So feel free to put any comments in the comment section here on Facebook, and we'll be happy to answer anything. Questions, you will maybe <laughs> scroll through and just see if anyone does have questions. I should have mentioned that in the beginning. Uh, again, you can always, as you're going through this later, if there's anything you have a question on, feel free to reach out to us. Let's see. Scroll through here for yeah. We've got some awesome joiners. Trail runner here. Hi, Bridget. We got Sierra, and Alicia, and Taylor. Hi, guys. Any advice on post-run nutrition? Stephanie said. Oh, there's a good topic. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole other topic. Um, yes, absolutely. Probably the biggest thing I see is people waiting too long to get something in. Um, in general, I actually usually do like some kind of powder or something easy on the digestive system, like a liquid nutrition at the end within 30 minutes, um, and then a full meal basically within an hour. Um, a lot of us get done and we're, you know, off doing this and that and that, so if you have something just ready to go and drink down, that's usually the easiest thing. And you want protein, you want some carbohydrates to replenish in that, um, but keep it kind of digestively simple for that initial aftermath. And hydration, sorry, rehydrate. <laughs> um, something that's when I'm watching from the sideline here, but you can see like some of the tests and exercises I was going through turned into the exact same strength move too. They all go together. So there's like a lot of key pieces where like even just having a little bit of a foundation or some ideas to start with will help with this. Um, we will reach back out and answer questions. So if you're watching this later, like we'll keep checking back if there's anything you wanted some clarity on. Uh, I'll also try to post those four movements and some ideas with that as well. Maybe even a quick nutrition summary too, so you have somewhere to start. Uh, anything else to touch on before we let you all go back to your lunch? I think that's it. 
Thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. See ya. We will see you out there. Yeah. All right. Bye guys.